Amen, amen. Well, we're in what, 16, 17 weeks of a gift called, uh, I mean, of a series called Stir It Up. And I think if there's one thing wrong with the Christian faith today is we do not know how to stir up the gift of God enough to make somebody that is not a believer become a believer. We do not know how to stir up the gift of God uh, uh, that's within us to make somebody a believer without quoting 100 scriptures. How many follow what I'm talking about? The disciples of old did, did not have a hundred scriptures to quote. They said, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. Right. They looked and they seen the disciples coming from Antioch. And the first time they called them Christians and the Christians simply meant little anointed ones like Jesus. They said, look, here comes the Christians. They weren't proclaiming. They didn't have a Jesus saved t-shirt. They didn't say turn or burn. They did nothing like that. There was just an anointing upon them that the others could see. The anointing on most Christians today is diminished by fear, anxieties, uh, 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 pain, sin, and, 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 and the stress of the things of the past. We're proclaiming we're Christians, but our actions, our lifestyle, at home, in private, deny it. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. There ain't nothing more important me to, to live like a believer in my home before, before my wife and my daughter. I do not go home and put on a different coat, a different jacket, a different sweater, and become a different person. I am who I am in front of you and behind your back. And I, I'm sad to say, most believers are not like that. Sure, I may, I may, you come to my house, I'm in my bathrobe. Straight up, in my sweats, and I ain't changing, I don't care who you are. I'm home, there's going to be a difference there. But my character is not going to change. And there's too many believers today whose character changes with the winds of time. Anytime a circumstance comes, they diminish their power in God. And anytime a circumstance comes, they fall back on what they know instead of relying on what God is or who God is. This is our final week. I wrote that down, but it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. As I started getting into it, the Holy Spirit started, you know, oh my God, I miss studying. Amen. I miss studying. I don't know how people can not read the word of God and not enjoy it. Something inside of you is not stirring up. You ever, you ever read, read a manifesto, articles of war of whatever sect you was from? You enjoyed learning it because it meant your survival. This means our survival, believer. We need to learn what's in the survival man manual so that we can survive when they all hell comes against you. Because I'm telling you, all hell is coming against us today. I'm not preaching hell and fire and damnation. I'm preaching victory. I'm making declarations of an almighty God of what we can do and who we can be in him. Amen. And we've been speaking about adverse circumstances in life. You're either going to stir up the gift of God in you or you're going to deny it and succumb to the circumstances of your life. And I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired and sick and tired of this heat in here right now. Can we please turn the AC on? <laughs> I am sick and tired of circumstances controlling my life. God is greater than our circumstances. Can we turn the AC on? Thank you. What happens when you stop allowing circumstances to dictate to you? You take its power away to destroy you. And you better believe the circumstances, that's their appointment to destroy you. John 10:10. 10, 10, turn your Bibles there. It reads like this. The thief came to steal, to kill, and destroy. And you could put the word circumstance in there because the enemy is behind most circumstances. Yes. Anytime you have a loss, let me tell you something, it's not God. Whenever there's a loss, it's always the enemy tempting you. It's always the enemy testing you. It's always the enemy testing your character and your constitution in God. It is never God. It is always the enemy. So the circumstances are Satan. The thief came only in order to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what, so if you know where somebody's coming from, and I say this all the time, I don't got to trip on somebody's character. If I know where they're coming from, they can't hurt me. How many follow that? It's when you don't know. Well, see, our eyes have been opened. Now that you know what circumstances are about, stop allowing it to rob you of your joy. Yes. That's the first thing it wants to take you is your joy. Because if you lose your joy serving God, I guarantee you, you ain't going to be serving him very long. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. If you have no strength to serve him, you're not going to serve him. Circumstances are around us. I don't care who you are, how rich you are, how poor you are, what your economic level is, or what your social status is. It is around you. Job was a man that got involved in circumstances that were beyond his control. He lost his cattle. He lost his 
children, he lost his wealth, he lost his servants, he lost his houses. He lost everything. But he was determined he get, to get a hold and to stay a hold of God in spite of his loss. What is the first thing that happens when we're in adverse circumstances and we don't understand it and it tears us apart emotionally? The first thing we want to let go of is God. The last place we want to be at is church. I'm going to tell you something. That's the first place you need to be at is in the house of God. Because through the preaching, the administration of the word or the fellowship of the saints, somebody may have that answer that you need to pick you up, to strengthen you, to encourage you again. That's why the Bible says not to forsake the assembling of the brethren. There's an important, you cannot put too much value on that. Most of us put zero value on that. But when the circumstances come and we're robbed of our joy, we're confused, we don't know what to do. Job went to God where the same circumstance Job's wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? Come on, somebody say amen. That's how many of us are today. We may not be saying, I'm going to curse God and die. We say, I'm not getting involved. I'm going to hold my breath. I'm going to stay here because I'm mad and I'm disappointed because God allowed this to happen. No, God did not allow anything to happen in your life that you didn't open up a door for. Come on, somebody say amen. Nothing ever came in my life that I didn't open up a door for. Somehow. And even Job, some oh Job opened the door himself saying, the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. I do not believe God wants you to have a pie in the sky uh, uh, relationship with him. What happens if you have a uh, uh, consistent life of adverse circumstances? Anybody have that? Wow, not one honest person in here. <laughs> I have had a consistent life of adverse circumstances. Starting when I was just a young man, wanting to do right, but it seemed like the odds were stacked against me. Thought if I could just get a job, I'll be okay. So at 16 years of age, I get a job at the Shell gas station. The assistant manager says, we'll hire you, we'll give you a chance. Go get a pair of brown pants, because that was the color, brown and yellow. He says, we got the shirt to fit you, but not the pants. Go get a pair of brown pants. I come back and the manager says, those are not brown enough. Adverse circumstances, you know, screw you. So I went out and did my thing. I allowed the circumstances to deter me from my goal. And that's what happens. The circumstances deter us from our goals. How many goals are you going to keep making before you decide to stay committed to it no matter what? No matter what, hell or high, no matter what comes against me, I'm holding on to this goal. I'm holding on to the promises of God and I'm not going to let go. But as I said, most Christians are weak and I'm not Christian bashing I'm just telling you a fact we sound mighty we sound powerful we're exuberant we're excited during worship Come on. but how about when you open up that letter it says we're coming after you Says go from here to here it's okay to go from here to here but you got to bounce back up here immediately Amen. The Bible says, give no place to the devil. Hell, wait a minute. The minute you realize it's not God, you jump back up. Cons consistent adverse circumstances cause us to develop a bad attitude and a bad outlook on life. We start to judge other people by our experiences and our attitudes because of what you went through. The Bible forbids that. It tells us not to do that. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. You're judging them based on your attitude and your outlook of life, not their struggles. We don't look at somebody's struggles. We just see their attitude. Now, if you knew their struggles, you probably might appreciate where they're at. I was listening to a preacher last night on uh, YouTube. I told him, I said, come here, you got to listen to this guy. Judgmentalism, criticism, tear, tearing people up. Bad with the word. And I'm sitting there thinking, how in the heck can anybody buy into this and feel good about themselves? They can't. That's why the Christian faith is failing miserably today. That's why we're not developing the way we're supposed to, because us as representatives are not standing up to that. I don't, I'm not saying fight against it. I'm saying standing up to it by demanding a change in your character, demanding a change in your attitude, and say, I am not going to, I'm not going to live like I used to live. I'm not going to think like I used to think. I'm going to become what the Bible says, a new creation. 
See, where I am today with my marriage and with my children, with other relationships, is not the man I used to be. I was the kind of guy I would latch on, woman. Amen. And expect her to latch on. And if she didn't latch on, well, pff, there's somebody else who will. I expected a woman to do for me. Don't look at me like that. Some of y'all have been serving the Lord for 20 years and still think that. I wouldn't wash a dish because it wasn't my job. Make a bed? You must be crazy. I don't care if we both work. You, the woman. Come on, keep it real. Come on, talk to me. God got a hold of me. I do more housework than my wife any day, does any day. I'll clean the toilet, make the bed, wash the clothes. And I put a fine line. I said, I ain't folding clothes. And one day I found myself folding clothes. Did it make me any less of a man? Yes, it did to my old character. Right, right. Do you hear what I'm saying? It sure did. But I wanted to attack that old character because it wasn't honoring what God said to honor and it wasn't becoming what God said I'm supposed to become. Why do you think the world don't want what we got? Because there's no change in our character. How are you going to get some old thug saved if you're still looking and thinking and acting like a thug towards your family? You're supposed to be the protector. The protector doesn't mean I'm fighting. The protector means you're guiding, you're leading. You're leading by example. Well, Hebrews 10, let's read. Hallelujah. You have need of steadfast patience. That means stop giving up every time you're in an adverse circumstance. How many times are you going to start over before you get tired of starting over? How many times are you going to get, uh, stop quitting before you get tired of quitting? You have need of steadfast patience and endurance so that you may perform and fully accept, accomplish the will of God and thus receive and thus, and because of this, you receive and carry away and enjoy the full what is promised. In other words, you walk away with the fullness of God's promises when you get steadfast patience. And endurance. See, the enemy expects you to quit when things don't work right. Mister, your wife expects you to lay down and find fault or fault find everything so that you have an excuse to quit. Shock her world. Shock his world and do just the opposite. And you begin to find out a spirit of endurance develops in your character. And all of a sudden, without even trying, you're walking in the promises and the blessings of an almighty God. It's sad to see so many believers trying to get what we already got. You just don't have the character to see it yet. Well, let me tell you this. Let me share this with you. Has anybody ever told you that you have the ability to do anything you want to do? How many of us believed it when they told us that? I've been told that my whole life and never believed it. Until I got tired of losing and stayed faithful to the vision and the plan that, I, that God gave me, and I was able to see things change. That's how I'm saying we have the ability, but we, we don't have the steadfast endurance to do it because we are quitters. I'm not saying that. The Bible's saying that. As I said, I don't believe that God wants you to have a pie-in-the-sky life on earth. You know, tiptoe through the tulips and, you know, eat jello and, you know, whipped cream every day. No, you're going to go through some stuff. Things ain't going to work right. You should spend $100 on your kid's shoe and he tore it up. And you, only got, and you only got $50 left. All right, things ain't going to go right all the time. But it does not have to affect the constitution of your character. You don't have to take it out on everybody around you. You can still be steadfast. That's a hard trait for a man to learn. You know, we say women are emotional. Come on, brother. God robbed the circumstances of its power Amen. to rob you. Amen. We just have not experienced it enough to believe it. Right. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's truth right there. We see it, we hear it, but we've not experienced it enough to know it. That's why we panic. Turn your Bibles to uh, Joshua chapter 10. God has given you 
and I, the, circum the, the ability or the power to change circumstances. And you know how the, 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 the first step to changing our circumstances is to be in steadfast, developing endurance, right. going forward no matter what. Amen. The second step is declare what he says in his word. You can't just keep going forward because before I served God, I had a tendency and a habit of going forward because that's what you had to do. Where I come from, you couldn't show weakness. You had to be strong and you had to keep going forward no matter what. I can't understand somebody getting beat up by the police who was playing the game and start crying because they got beat up by the police. They asked one time, why are you running? I said, I'm a criminal, you're a cop. I did my job, you do your job. How many follow that? That's just the way it was. I'm supposed to run. You're supposed to try to catch me. You don't cry about nothing. You just handle it. But it's amazing. I want to talk to the men. It's amazing how many hardcore men I see come into the house of God and all of a sudden lose their character. They get mad because this guy didn't shake his hand. They get mad because this guy's ignoring him. Man, you know how many people I have met in my life that ignored me before? That knew me, that we were part partners six months ago, and I see them. It's your problem, man. But here we come into the house of God, and all of a sudden become weak. The Bible says be strong in the Lord. I'm not talking about your strength. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Turn the circumstances around. It's amazing how many times and throughout the process of everything that I'm involved in doing, I run across people. You know, people are basically judgmental. Right? And you can tell pretty much right where they segment you at when you say hello. I used to take it so personal that I would get upset about it. Now I take it a person and go, you know, dude, I'm turning that character around. How many follow that? And I get in there and I smile. How you doing? I, you know, I ain't kissing their butt. But I'm showing them who this is, not what this is. How many follow that? I don't lay down and quit. I'm going forward. You're an instrument that's in the way. You're the instrument that I'm supposed to uh, tap into to get over here. I'm not going to allow your character to make me shut down and lose faith and lose confidence and quit. I'm going to win you. And I'm going to tell you today, there's not been one person that I've not been able to do that because I understand that God gives us the ability to change circumstances. You have the power to do that. We just, it has not been taught. It has not been preached. It's been slipped away by the church. What has been taught is doctrine. What has been taught is how to dress. What's been taught is how to walk. What's been taught is who to talk to, who to separate yourself from. Don't do this. Don't do that. Heaven is not full of don'ts. Heaven is full of do's. That's right. Amen. I don't do what I used to do because I don't want to because I got something better. But if you ain't got better yet, keep doing what you don't want. Or keep doing what you like doing, uh, but keep coming to get a hold of this till you get something better. Don't allow, the, don't allow the hypocrisy of the church to keep you out from getting the truth. Well, I don't go to church because a bunch of hypocrites. I ain't never been to a bar where there weren't hypocrites. <laughs> never. I've been to a lot of bars. A lot of dope houses. Oh, none of my dealers were ever hypocrites. <laughs> Hate my guts, but my money was good. Hey, I'm glad to see you. No, you ain't, sucker. You're glad to see my 20. Right. Hypocritical. Right. It didn't bother us then, but we'll allow it to keep us out of the church doors. Hmm. You're not here for somebody. You're here for you. Yeah. You understand? There, You're here for you. Get your eyes off them and put your eyes on the prize. Circumstances in your life are up to you. You change them or you embrace them. If you embrace them, you're going to lose. I don't embrace circumstances because I, I don't like adverse circumstances. I don't like what I was going through. And I, I want to keep trying to get up, keep trying to get up. I want to push through, push through, push through. I'm pushing through right now. And when it's all said and done, I'll get through on the other side. Turn to Joshua chapter 10. Let's read. 
Then Joshua spoke to the Lord on the day whom the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites. And he said, he said in the sight of them, they're in battle. The Israelites are in battle. Israel said, son, be silent and stand still. Listen, it was getting later. They didn't have lights. And in the midst of the darkness, Israel would start losing the battle. So Joshua said, them, wait a minute. This is an adverse circumstance right now. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm serving an almighty God. Son, be still. Listen to this. And the son obeyed. For the span of 24 hours, the son stood there and stayed in its place till Israel won the battle. Doesn't the scripture say Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Now, I'm not saying we're going to go out there and say, son, be still, and it's going to stand. But I will tell you this. Years ago, I was borrowing my sister-in-law's Jeep. And she had a Jeep with no top on it and everything. You know, and I've never been in a Jeep in my life. Never. It was not my style. Nothing, you know. And I'm saying, hey, I got a big smile on my face. This is kind of cool. I can understand why these guys enjoy these cars. Not that I was going to, but I was able to understand it for the first time. And all of a sudden, it started to rain. <laughs> and, you know, I don't want to wrinkle my clothes. You know, nothing like that. Don't want to get wet. There was no top. Just me in the rain. And I prayed, God, I'm asking you, Father, in Jesus' name, hold the rain back till I get in the garage. 30, 40 minutes later, I didn't, and I'm not talking about just a couple drops. It was, it was raining. The rain stopped. I got to her house, backed the car into the, uh, garage, into the carport. As soon as I backed in the carport, bam, the rain started coming down. Made me a believer that we, are, we have the authority over the circumstances. See, and you tell, you tell people that, and they go, I don't think so. That's a fairy tale. There ain't no fairy tale. It's a reality, but you got to press through. you got to develop a spirit of endurance so that you can experience that. we got too many believers today try, trying to stir up the gift of God that have never experienced anything. They've not pressed through long enough to experience anything. They come to church two, three weeks, they give one or two tithes, and then they expect God to move on a puppet, move like a puppet. It don't work like that. You're going to be tested. You're going to be tried. The Bible says like, and, and fired up like pure gold. And when you come forth, you shall rise to the top every single time. But you got to have a spirit of steadfast endurance. I'm coming even though I don't want to go. You don't know how much it broke my heart that I could not get here last Sunday. Amy, it's not me. It is not me. I don't care what's going on in my life. I am here. I don't care if I have to be here. I am here. I felt like I lost something but I can get it back. Amen. Amen. Your worst circumstance, all it is is a matter of perspective. Right. It's not greater than the one before. Right. My circumstances have not gotten greater. My perspective has changed. Yeah. That's all it is. The last one I thought was going to kill me. Right. It didn't. The last one I thought was going to bankrupt me. It didn't. The last one I thought was going to destroy me. It didn't, but this one will. Because it's all about perspective. So how is your perspective today? Is your perspective focused on the greatness of an almighty God? Or is your perspective on the government's open again? Things are going to start flowing. Come on, talk to me. It's amazing how political believers have become. We're supposed to pray for our leaders. Not criticize, not condemn, not fault find. I would not want to be the president of the United States and have to make the decisions that I don't have all the information on to make that he does. My responsibility, your responsibility as a believer is to pray for him that the Holy Spirit will lead him. Whether you believe he's a godly or ungodly man, it doesn't matter. God directs and develops ungodly men as well can't tell you how many men in my life God has brought my way to bless me 
to help me get somewhere where I couldn't get to that were not even saved. And it was God that put it in their heart. They would say, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I just feel led to do this. God can do the same for our government today without you getting involved and acting like some. And what makes you think somebody's going to want the God you serve when you've got the same attitude about everything they do? I ain't stressing about the government. I'm not stressing about the borders. I'm praying, God, have your way. God, move in a miraculous way. You're the God of all circumstances. The key to overcoming your circumstance is your expectation. If the level of your expectation is, this sucks. <laughs> Amen. Guess what's going to happen? It's going to suck. Because that's your expectation. It don't get no bad. Man, I'm, here we go again. Well, guess what? You're going to go there again. Because that's your expectation. How many of you woke up this morning with an expectation that whatever you're dealing with, that today's the end of it? Not because of something you heard, but because, the, see, this is, this is where we get, 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 get it wrong. Everybody's coming to church. God, I want to hear something to change me. No, you're going to get a quickening to what you heard that changes you. See, I'm not looking to hear something. I'm looking for a quickening, something that resonates in my spirit. And when it resonates in my spirit from the pulpit, somebody says something that will trigger something in my spirit. I don't even hear anything else they said because I was quickened and the Holy Spirit took me down the path of the words of righteousness and developed something inside of me. We got it wrong, saints. You're looking to the man. You're looking to the man who's preaching the word. All he's doing is proclaiming what God's word says. And when he says that one word, Kenneth Copeland uh, uh, put out a, 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 book that a, ser a series of books that said one word can change your life. Yes. Amen. That one word can quicken something inside of you that can transform you. Right. It's not the whole message. It's that one word. Yes. Are you expecting to hear a word yes. that will trigger something inside of you? Or do you, oh, I'm going to church because it's Sunday. No, I'm going to church expecting something. Yes. And if you come expecting, guess what happens? Amen. You, you get it. Yes. Turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. <laughs> Hallelujah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had raised their level ex of expectancy. The king says, if you don't bow down and worship me at the sound of this trumpet, you're going in the fiery furnace. Now before him is a fiery furnace that they turned up hotter seven times. But he made a declaration about what he was expecting, even though they turned the furnace up seven times. See, when... How many remember the phrase, wolf tickets? <laughs> Amen. Somebody sells us a wolf ticket. You didn't panic about it before. You stood up to the challenge. A wolf ticket means, this is what I'm going to do to you. Yeah. Amen. Muhammad Ali was great was selling wolf tickets. He would go to Joe Frazier's house in his bus and stand in front of his house in his bus. Now you got, the fight game was not like this before. It was all professional, all right? But when uh, Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay at the time, had beat Sonny Liston, it changed the fight game. He pulled up in front of Sonny Liston's house in front of his bus with his entourage and he gets out. Hey, gorilla, I'm going to come, I'm going to knock you out, and after I knock you out, I'm going to knock out your mama. He started mama talking to him. Amen. And you know why he did that? He was not only a great box, strategic boxer, but he was also a great student of the psyche. He got under his skin so that he couldn't think right and couldn't, 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 couldn't concentrate, and he was so worked up and angry by the time he got in the ring, he defeated himself before he got in the ring. Yeah. Right. That's exactly what circumstances are doing to you. Right. They're selling you wolf tickets. Say, you know what? You're going to lose your home. You're going to lose your job. Your children are going to hell. Look, they're doing drugs. They're doing this, they're doing that. Forget God said if you're saved, your whole household will be saved. The circumstances are selling you wolf tickets, and you're listening. You're not standing your ground and saying, no, greater is he that's in me than is in the world. You're not standing your ground and saying, no, God said if I'm saved, my whole household will be saved. You're hearing the wolf tickets being sold and you're buying into it and you defeat yourself. 
I'm telling you, when the enemy comes against you, when circumstances comes against you, they better know that it's for a fight of their life. Amen. You're not going to lay down and die quickly. You're going to stand, you're going to fight with every fiber of your being. Amen. I'm going to tell you something, we're all going to die one day. When death comes to my door, he's going to know he's going to end for a fight because I'm not going to surrender. So I'm not going to surrender on that day. Why well, am I going to surrender when I'm alive? Let's read. My expectation is greater than the circumstance. Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, it is not necessary for us to answer you on this point. You know what he's saying? We don't even have to dwell about this. We don't even have to discuss this. We've already come to a conclusion before you said this. If our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, he will deliver us out of your hand. That's their expectation. If our God is able, he will deliver us. But if not, listen, this is the caveat. Let it be known unto you. We want you to know the kind of men we are. We believe in our almighty God no matter what. Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Even if he don't deliver me, I'm still not going to bow down. My trust and confidence is still in him. If it looks like I'm losing, my confidence is still in him. If it looks like I'm not going to come through, my confidence is still in him. If it looks like nothing's right, I'm still trusting him. I'm not going to bow down to you or no, I'm going to worship what you got to worship because my God is able. Now listen, earlier we said you have need of steadfast patience that you might receive the promises of God. They throw them in the fiery furnace. See, you can't get the promise of God until you stand up to that kind of mess. And the king looks in and goes, wait a minute. Didn't we throw four in there? There's a fourth one in there. And it's like the son of God. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, come out of here. And the Bible says they, he called them out of the fire. And they didn't even smell like smoke. You see, in the midst of your worst circumstances, God can preserve you and keep, it, keep you from being touched by the stench of it. When you have a determination of how you're going to act if you have to go through it. See, most believers will serve God and be happy about serving God if they don't go through anything. Amen. Because the preachers of America, and shame on them, if you want to be saved, you want to get out of all your misery, just come to Jesus and Jesus will save you. No, he won't. My Bible tells me that, I mean, he'll save you, but he's not going to remove the stench and the stain of sin and what you've been sowing all these years overnight just because you become a Christian. My Bible tells me that the son of man, the son of God, was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil himself. So if he's going to be tempted and tested, what makes you think you're not going to be? But I want to live in a bubble. I want to live in a cocoon. <sighs> The level of your expectation should be based on God's ability, Amen. not your desire. The level of your expectation ought to be based on God's ability. They said, if our God can keep us, they're stating God's ability. Not, I don't want to go in there. But if he don't, I'm still not going to say, what is it? and this is the problem. Most people don't understand God's ability. We don't allow God to prove himself. Every time we get into a position where God wants to prove himself, we quit, we surrender, we lay down, we die. We stop going forward. I would have never seen God move in the ways that he did if I didn't keep going forward no matter what was going on in my life. We've been in circumstance. We've been together 30 years. Over. She's always correcting me. Went to go see a house yesterday. The guy said, well, how long have you been married? I went 20 years. She goes 30-something. And he goes, yep, you guys are married. <laughs> <laughs> We've been through some stuff for 30, over 30 years. And that entire time frame, I can stand and tell you, she's never seen me waver as a man of God, which affected her walk. How many follow what I'm talking about? Was it easy for me? No, because my walk was attacked on a regular basis because people that don't understand your walk want to attack it. You're hard. You don't understand. You're insensitive. You just don't care. No, it's not that I don't care. It's that I care about the one that does care that can make things change and I'd rather submit to his plan than to cow down and cater to you whereas we're going to stay in this circle until we both decide to have our trust and confidence in him. Unfortunately, that's why most marriages fail in the faith, in the Christian faith. Because the man most times don't have the constitution to stand in the midst of marital problems when the wife is saying whatever she's saying. 
You going to church again? You'd rather be at church more than you want to be with me. What about us? <laughs> Amen. At least, babe, you know where I'm at now. Before I was saved, you didn't say this stuff and you had no idea where I was. But you didn't want to say anything because of the person I was. But now I'm changing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Turn around and tell your wife he's talking the truth. You know how soft they said that? <laughs> Again, the level of your expectation should be based on God's ability. And God's ability is this. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? You see, I come up in the faith when, when communism was still here. I come up in the faith where, 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 where much of the world couldn't have Bibles. And, and I would read these chick magazines and how they'd be smuggling Bibles and so forth and so on. And I remember one in particular that they were, uh, ran across the uh, Czechoslovakian border and they had Bibles in their trunk and, 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 and the, uh, they prayed, God, blind their eyes. And they opened up the trunk and the guards didn't see it. That inspired me. That done something. And I came up in a church that understood about the power of God and didn't talk about doctrine, but they talked about the power of God. And it put something inside of me. And when I read that, I said, God, I want to do that one day. Little did I know what God had in store for me. He opened up a door for me and I went to China before they tore the wall down. Or before they opened up China, rather. And went into Shenzhen City. We were smuggling Bibles in Shenzhen City, which was inside of China. It wasn't Hong Kong. It was inside of China. And they give us these satchels of uh, uh, Bibles and, and, and they tell us not to look at one another. And they give us directions how to go left, right, left, straight, and all this other stuff. And we're supposed to meet at a certain place. And they said, whatever you do, once you get past the border, do not put your satchels on the conveyor belt. I don't want to go to jail, period, let alone jail in China. Amen. Amen. I've seen them documentaries cutting grass with scissors. They want to do that. So there's this lady in front of me, and she's carrying her Bibles, and the guard slaps her suitcase and she's ignoring him just walks away and he looks at me and he snaps by and looks right at me and points I had no choice I put it on there and I says God if you ain't never blinded somebody's eyes you need to blind their eyes because I didn't call for these Bibles somebody else did uh, I, and I need you to save me I'm standing here as an ambassador yes, amen. and I watched trying to look stoic <laughs> but panicking inside because I know what cops look for when they think you're suspicious. And these guys are trained. The conveyor belt went through, the bags went through, and I hesitated just for a second. And I said, those are mine. I picked them up. Their eyes were blinded. Amen. You know what that did? That elevated my faith to believe God a little bit more. I wouldn't have got there if I didn't have that steadfast endurance and kept going forward when I didn't want to go forward. So why are we not allowing or why are we not seeing the hand of God move? Because we quit just before he moves every single time. God's got greatness for us to experience, but we got all these excuses for not going forward. I got a headache. I can't go to church, Pastor. How many ever stayed home from work because you had a headache? I got into work so hungover I couldn't think straight. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You got into work where you shouldn't have gone to work and wonder how in the heck you made it. Oh my God, if it's raining outside, drizzling, oh, it's too cold. The level of your expectation, see, the problem is we don't have an expectation of God. I'm expecting God to do great things. But if I'm expecting God to do great things, it's also expecting something out of me. He's expecting my all. And I've never seen an institution of any value on the face of this earth that, uh, that demands a portion of you. It demands your all. When you decide to get your education, it's not just a little bit of you. It demands all your time, all your energy. Your social life is put on a shelf. Your spending is put on a shelf. And you're focusing on that prize because it demands your all. 
What makes you think God is any short of that? Right. See, we just want to come to church. We want to give God 20%, 30%, 10%, 5%. And we want to reap the blessings and the benefits. And when we don't get it, we want to blame God. No. Our expectation of God does not measure up to what he will do if we persevere, we go through. Zechariah chapter 4. It's based on God's ability. How many times have you looked at something or gone through something and questioned whether God can do it or not? Come on, let's be real. We, go through, we experience something in life, we say, oh my God, I don't know if God can do this. My pastor's wife one time stood up and asked prayer for her brother because he was a heroin addict. He said, I would like uh, the church to pray for my brother because he's a heroin addict. And I know God can save him, but I don't know. I listen to that and I think, what are you standing up asking for prayer for then? Sit down, shut up. Amen, you're discouraging the rest of us. I'm praying, believing he can, and you're doubting it, you're questioning it. Much of the Christian church is like that today. We're asking God to do, do something. See, my Bible tells me, if my people which are called by my name shall humble, humble, pray, and seek my faith, then I will heal their land. He was saying, if you do these things, you can expect me to move in the land. See, we're not doing those things. There's a big religious political movement that has infiltrated the government today that is trying to move the government's hand the same way both parties are trying to do it, by might and intimidation. God said you can move it if you seek my face, if you pray, if you call upon me, a different expectation receives a different blessing. Yes, come on. I have a high expectations of God. That means I have to have high expectations of how I serve him. And my expectations are based on his word. Yes. Zechariah chapter 4 says, Not by might. Then he said to me, This addition, addition to the bowl of the candlestick, Causing the yield, where the heck you at, bro? Oh, yeah. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might or by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. We're not getting anything done because we're strong. We're 2,500 strong. We're not getting anything done because there's a bunch of us in one accord. It's his spirit and his spirit alone. Let me share this with you. Within 15 years... The average membership of this church has been 100. Mm. Paid off a $678,000 note and put over $500,000 of improvements in both buildings. Right. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Right. That's without rolling a burrito, killing a chicken, or washing a car. Right. Without none of that. Right. It's a calling upon an almighty God. To do what he would, said he would do if we stand. That's right. My expectation is God can do exceedingly abundantly above all I can ask, imagine, or think. What is your expectation? You see, here's what happens when our expectation, when, 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 when uh, um, great circumstances come our way. And I don't want to diminish your lifestyle. I don't want to diminish what you're going through. But... We focus on the threats around us instead of the throne above us. The threats become greater than the throne. And it shouldn't be that way. Stop walking in your own strength and elevate your expectations. So how do we elevate our expectations? Get unstuck from your religious traditions. There are so many believers that are stuck in the religious way of doing things. Oh, we want to sing the songs of old. We want to do things the way they used to do things. We want to have rallies and we want to do this. Well, that was before God's doing something totally different. It grieves my heart every time I run across somebody from the past and they, they keep on redoing, rehashing what was done 20, 30 years ago. Listen to me, believers. If you want this generation, this millennial generation... If we don't do something with ourselves, they're going to die without having experienced a living God. The Muslim faith is the fastest growing religion on the face of the earth. And I just found this out just yesterday, especially among Latinos. 
in Mexico, they're turning from Catholicism by the thousands to the Muslim faith. That blew my mind. You know why? Because the power of God is void in our lives. It's become nothing but religious tradition and dry, stale experiences. Come on. We don't talk about God's greatness. Let me share this. Let me read this with you. In the next half, half century or so, Christianity, long reign, Christianity's long reign as the world's largest religion may come to an end, according to a just-released report that builds on Pew Research Center's original population growth projections for religious groups. Indeed, Muslims will grow more than twice as fast as the overall world population between 2015 and 60. And the second half of the century will likely surpass Christians as the world's largest religious group. They believe in the God that they serve. One of their mantras, expressions of faith is Allah Akbar. It means God is great. They do that before they blow themselves up. You know what they're saying? God is greater than my suicide bombing. God is greater than the action I'm doing here. Talk to me. They're believing their God is greater than them taking their own life. We can't believe his God is greater than us missing a bill. Come on, talk to me. I'm short $25 and my tithes was 50. If I didn't get my tithes, I'd have double. I'd be up 25. God's not greater. Your children are listening to what you're not saying when you're at home. I'm not focusing on the Muslim faith, but they are to me inspiring to the fact that they will spend their time teaching their little babies this young that God is greater. God's greater than the government. God's greater than any institution on earth. God's greater than any, any prejudice that you're going to experience. Allah Akbar, God is great. God is good. But you listen to us today. Here's what he said. He said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you before my father on that day. On. We're ashamed. We didn't mean us. We're not ashamed of God. But when, somebody, when you got a sickness in your body and, or somebody else got a sickness in your body, are you quick to tell them about the healing God that you serve? No, you're not because you don't know about the healing God that you serve because you're not persevered long enough to find out that he does heal. You only know it here. You don't know it here. So you can't say God is greater, so you shut it up inside your spirit and you don't make a declaration of somebody that desperately needs it. Right. Tell it. Amen. tells somebody, you may not like it, but he's telling you the truth. Amen. Our religious traditions are destroying the power of God, especially in the arena of our praise and our worship. I got a few minutes. I want to finish this aspect of it. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. Hallelujah. Mark 7, 13. Let's read. Is that AC on? I know you're going to tell me it's me, but it, it's, it, I still need it. Now. Brother Fred, please, AC. Thus you are nullifying and making void. What does void mean? Empty. Making empty. Listen to this. No effect. The authority of the word. The word of God has authority. The centurion said, Lord, speak the word only and my child shall be made whole. See, we're such a respected person. I want the pastor to come lay hands on me. Why? Speak the word. I had a sister a couple weeks ago. She Pastor, I'd like you to come over to my, my son's house. I'd like you to bless, my, bless his house. And I look at her and go, why? She goes, well, you know, that's just what I said. Sis, you got the same authority. I, here's what I wanted to do when I instructed her. And it was a joy to see her light up. Amen. Now it could have been an act. She would have walked out. That sucker don't want to ever pay, work for his pay. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't get fulfilled by you dependent upon me. I get fulfilled by you taking the word of God and walking in the authority of that. Realizing that the same privilege I have before God, you have before God. But we make that... Authority void by our tradition. The fivefold ministry. Ooh, the fivefold ministry is here. You are part of this. 
God has no respect to persons. God don't look at Billy Graham any different than he looks at me. He's got a different reward. But he looks upon both of us the same. He looks upon you the same way he looks upon me. We may have different rewards, but we have the same standing with him. And we don't understand that because we ain't been taught that. Therefore, we come before God begging. Oh, God, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. Oh, God, please bless me. Instead of going boldly to the throne of grace and making a demand, not a demand by this is what I want now, but a, a demand like King Hezekiah. Lord, you know I've been faithful. Lord, you know I haven't given up. You know I haven't quit, Lord. You know I've been going forward. Now, he, the, the prophet came. He said, I'm going to die. But God, I'm asking you on the basis of my merit, on the basis of what I've done, extend life to my years or years to my life. And before the prophet left the court, God got a hold of him and said, Hezekiah is right. He was faithful. He never gave up. Go back and tell him I'm granting him 15 more years. Amen. That's the power we have with God. Amen. But we don't believe it. If we believed it, we'd walk in it. You are nullifying and making void and of no effect the authority of the word of God through your tradition. Now, I know tradition. Sing three songs, three strings, four songs. Let's have some real worship. And let's cry. Amen. Let's have a good cry before the Lord. And I came up under that. We sing songs like, On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. My voice is really bad. <laughs> The emblem of suffering and shame. So I'll cling to the old rugged cross. We go on and on and on. We sing that. And pretty soon we'd start getting emotional. We'd start crying. And thinking we were being broke. Well, it was just soulish. There was no real motion there. And then the whole church would be there. And people that had no experience with that look, oh, what a bunch of freaks. A bunch of weirdos. Stuck in our tradition, wanted to stay stuck back in the 1960s, 1970s worship. This is a church of proclamation. God is great. Every one of our songs talks about the goodness and the greatness of God for a reason. Because we want you to understand that when the fire comes, God's stronger than the fire. When the floods come, God's stronger than the flood. When you feel like quitting, God's your strength. You can't understand that when all you're doing is crying in your beer, so to speak. Oh, gee, just, that was a good encounter for you to learn how to worship. But when we come gathered together, we need to learn how to lift up the banner and make the declaration of an almighty God. Because the world doesn't know that God is able. Because they see us cowering in the corner like a bunch of little cowards. I just don't know what God's going to do. Oh, my God, I'm going to fall apart. No, I'm not going to fall apart. Again, those chick magazines, I seen a, a family that was stuck somewhere in the, you know, Siberia or something like that, were snowing all the time and they were starving, they had no food. And every day this dog would come out of nowhere, those big huskies, and feed them. I went through some adverse circumstances. Got laid off a job I shouldn't have got laid off of. I was the shop steward. Shop stewards are untouchable. That was the worst thing to give someone like me. <laughs> a title of being untouchable. <laughs> I mean, no, my character didn't fit that well. <laughs> That's why I lost it. <laughs> my kids got sick. My money ran out. They had pneumonia. Had no food. But I remember the chick books. And I prayed, I said, God, I know that you're still God. And as a matter of fact, on my way home with my last check, I stopped at the Bible bookstore and I got a plaque that said, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And the first thing I brought in the door before I stepped in. <laughs> How many follow that? I'm going to tell you something. I opened up my front door and there would be bags of grocery there on a regular basis. God is able. The adverse circumstances is a matter of perspective. I didn't trip on the circumstances. I tripped on an almighty God. Okay, God, I'm going to sit back and watch how you're going to do this one. And while you're doing it, I'm going to make proclamations of who you are. That's why we make proclamations who he is. Because some of us got some thick skulls. Amen? Amen. You know, we've been making these proclamations. Some of you have been stuck in wanting to get in that old time religion. And it didn't do any good when you was there. 
The reason why it's so mesmerizing now because it's in the past and the past is always mesmerizing. Oh my God, the good old days. Hey, I remember Billy Bob. I remember Poncho. I remember Lucy. I remember Sally. Oh, they were so good to me. They weren't good to you back then. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> if they were good to you back then, you'd still be with them. Amen. Go to Psalms 71. We are supposed to be declaring his works. We're stuck in worship, which is an, an, another generation is wanting more. This generation wants more than your stale, dry worship. They want to feel something rising up on the inside of them that's greater than the problems they have because this generation has greater problems than we ever had, ever had to face. You think you're going to win? Listen to me, saints. We used to get together we'd get, we, and, we, and we'd get through instruction called the Romans Road, how to lead somebody to Christ by the, uh, the uh, Romans 3.23, 6.23, and I forget what the other one is, but it was just three scriptures and lead them to the Lord. We'd t- uh, t- uh, uh, be taught how to evangelize, how to knock on doors. I had a friend of mine in, in Oakland that he, could, he, you know, he, he built his church on this principle. 60 seconds he could lead you to the Lord. And they did that. They knocked on the door. Pastor Bob Jackson, Acts Full Gospel Church. That's how he built his church. Let me share this with you. There's nothing wrong with that for him. But that's not God. And it may have been at the moment. But God is doing a new thing today. Amen. And some of us are stuck in the past, are, not making, are, 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 are making a mistake, and not staying in tune with what God's doing. God never changes per se because he's God, but he changes. We see him differently, and that changes us. I see a different aspect of God today after serving him for almost 30 years than I did 30 years ago. How many follow this? So I'm able to see him more clear, and if I see him more clear, it ought to give me the ability and the strength to demand a change in my life. And if I don't, I may see the change. I may see him a little bit more, but I only still see him the way he was 30 years ago. And there's no change Therefore, it stops me from obtaining the blessings of God. Am I, am I making myself clear? Yes. Let's read Psalm 71. My mouth shall tell of your righteous acts. It doesn't say I'm going to cry about your goodness. My mouth is going to tell of your righteous. I can't tell you how many times we stood up all night long and the sun came up and we're talking about all the goodness of an almighty God. And of your deeds and of salvation all the day. For their number is more than I know. I will come in the strength and with the mighty acts of the Lord God. I will mention your praises, your righteousness, even yours alone. He's saying, this is what I'm putting on myself. I'm going to mention God's acts to anybody who stands still long enough. Excuse me for putting so many posts about God's goodness on Facebook. It's a platform. I'm not trying to blend in with everybody else false present uh, pretensions of what joy is. I'm trying to show you where I can derive my joy. Oh God, you have taught me from my youth and hitherto you have I declared your wondrous works. When's the last time you stood up and declared God's wondrous works? You might think that it was a coincidence that you got spared from that accident. It was no coincidence. The hand of God was on you. You just didn't acknowledge it. The more you acknowledge it, the more you could see it. Yea, even when I'm old, gray-headed, yes, sir. Oh, God, forsake me not, but keep me alive until I've declared your mighty strength to this generation. This generation needs to understand the declarations of an almighty God. And they can't understand until they say, see, you go through your mess and still hold on to God. And your might and power to all that are to come. I would not want to be in this generation today. Not with the examples we see. Amen. Turn your Bible to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Hallelujah. Isaiah 43 says that God's doing a new thing. Will we not know it? Hallelujah. I'm going to try and win the world with my Bible. You know what? Google is this generation's best friend. Amen. When I got saved, we didn't have nothing. Somebody come us with a Bible and say, well, you know what? Here's what the Word of God has to say about this. And you know what? I guarantee you, you tell somebody that, they're going to pull out their Bibles. Well, this is what Google says. We had to take you for your word. 
Today, they, the information generation, they don't have to, and they're going to challenge you. And they could challenge your knowledge of the word, but they can never challenge your experience that stands for itself. They can never challenge the power of God in your life. It will be enticing. It will be intriguing. They'll, it'll make them want what you got. I believe that I've got a little influence over a lot of the youth that grew up here. They've been in my home on a regular basis. They've seen me interact with my daughter on a regular basis. They've seen me in my sweats. They've seen me just vegetating. They've watched me for 20 years. And they've seen nothing but the power of God, which made them want it that much more. See, people aren't hearing what you're saying. They're watching what you're doing. So are we allowing the circumstances of life to suck life out of us? Or are we consistently making declarations of an almighty God? See, because it's not the worship that's going to move the world. It's the declarations of God because everybody's looking for something. When they're saying Allah Akbar, when they're saying God is greater, they're making a declaration to everybody else. Forget about what's going on around you. It is insignificant compared to Allah. I'm not saying it is. I'm saying they are saying it is. Because there is one God. Amen. That's what I'm saying. But we're not making the same declarations. What we're saying by, on the basis of our actions, the greater the trial, the lesser our God is. The bigger our problem, the smaller our God is. So I'm going to ask you today, how big or how small is your God? Is his size determined by the stuff that you go through? Or is it determined by the greatness of his word alone? Listen what he expects out of the proclaimers. You see, I'm a proclaimer. I proclaim all the time what God can do and what God will do. And if I counsel you, I'll hear what you have to say, but I don't care about your excuses. Plain and simple, that's what they are. Well, you know, you know I'm... <laughs> I got a bad back and I've been on these pain pills for five years because I got a bad back. No, you got a bad back because you don't want to press through to get off those pain pills. Right. Oh, you don't understand. I've been there. I made excuses. So you may not know this, but I've been in extreme pain for the last month dealing with these kidney stones. Extreme pain. For the last two weeks on a lot of medication and couldn't stand it. I told him, you know, this ain't getting a hold of me. More than a month? I've been that agitated with you? <laughs> Amen. It's been a long time. Probably more than two weeks on the, med on the meds. No meds today. No meds yesterday. No meds. I said, that's it. Why? Because God's greater. I had to do it. Well, I had to do it. But I don't have to do it. See, some of us don't understand God's greatness. We think, you know, Norco's greater than God. No, it ain't. It'll rob you. Amen. It might feel better for the moment, but when it takes everything that you got, you go, oh my God, what did I do? We're supposed to proclaim in the midst of our weakness, in the midst of our shortcomings, in the midst of our circumstances, the greatness of an almighty God. It's the proclaimers that lead to victory. Let's read 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And they rose early in the morning and they went out in the wilderness of Tekiah. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. You shall be established. Believe God, not the circumstances. Believe and remain steadfast to his prophets. Believe what the prophets are saying if it's lined up with what God is saying. And you shall prosper. God's promise in you. You shall overcome what you're dealing with if you believe. Oh, yes. When he consulted with the people, he appointed singers to sing to the Lord and praise him their holy priestly garments. As they went out before the army, listen, the singers went before the army. Yes. God gave you a voice for a reason. Lift it up. He gave you speech for a reason. Lift it up. Make declarations of what, not after the fact. Before the fact. You think this got me? You watch God move. 
saying, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and loving kindness and endure forever. And here's what happens when the proclaimers begin to, to shout. And when they began to sing, you don't, gotta, you don't gotta praise them long. When they began to praise, the Lord said, ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab. And Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were self-slaughtered. Self -slaughtered. Amen. You put the enemy to flight. You confuse the enemy. He don't know what to do when you start proclaiming instead of complaining. But isn't it easier to complain? Did you learn something? Come on, give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. 